So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark McCormick, um, who has a lab at the University of New Mexico. Um, he's an assistant professor there. Uh, before starting his lab, he got a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and another Bachelor of Science in Biology from UT Austin, my nemesis undergraduate institution. I went to Texas A&M. <laughs> And uh, after getting his uh, multiple bachelor degrees, uh, Mark went on to uh, UCSF and got his PhD uh, studying the basic biology of aging um, in Dr. Kimian's lab, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then he did a postdoc at the Buck um, with Brian Kennedy, and then you spent some time with Matt too, kind of, right? Was well, we just collaborated with Matt through the whole time, but then I, I got to teach at the Woods Hole Aging course when Matt and Daniel were the directors, so that gave me an, okay. another chance to interact with them. So that's the connection to UW as well. Yeah, so so um, Mark's lab uh, uses multiple model systems to look for conserved biology that helps us understand aging and um, eventually delay the onset of age-related disease in humans is, is the ultimate goal. But Mark has a, a pretty smart approach of looking in multiple model systems to make sure he doesn't go down any um, organism-specific rabbit holes in, in so far as he's trying to search for conserved mechanisms of longevity that will end up helping us lead healthier, uh, better qualities of life as we age. Um, so with that, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, turn it over to Mark, and I hope we all enjoy the next 45 minutes or so, and then we can ask him any questions we want. Mark, how do you feel about people interrupting? Do you want to go with Yeah, it? get in there. Okay, terrific. So anyone has a question? I was just going to say that, yeah. Yeah, chat it up, put it in the chat, and I can pop in and interrupt Mark if it doesn't pop up so, so you can attention. Yeah, one in administrative thing is that um, I can't see the chat, so I'm, I'm yes. very okay. happy to take questions during, but you'll have to just give me a shout. Yeah, so so chat it up, and I will be paying attention to the chat, um, and I will interrupt Mark and, and ask a question for anyone else. So with that, uh, go for it. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks very much for that introduction, Alex. And Thanks for this invitation and the opportunity to talk to all of you guys a little bit about some recent work in my lab. Um, and like Alex just said, this is this looks more like a jazz club audience than a rock arena audience. So we we shouldn't have any trouble taking questions throughout and getting through the things. So so please jump in if you have them. So um, you got this part, I think. So some of you may be familiar with this spiel if you work on aging, but for those of you who aren't, I'm going to walk you through this sort of thing. And over time, we face an increase in many seemingly disparate diseases, such as diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this figure that I'm pointing at is actually drawn by one of your UW pathology faculty, and I borrowed it from this Faculty 2000 Prime Reports. And what it's showing you here, in each of the four little cartoons, there's the risk of death on the y-axis and your age on the x-axis. And you can see that for these four extremely important uh, medical conditions, your chance of dying goes up monotonically as you age. Now the shape is a little different for each of them, but the news is not good the older you get, right? And so they all have an underlying shared risk factor, a very strong risk factor, which is aging. So if you, if student aged person, when undergrad in the audience perhaps goes in with a mole on their shoulder, they're gonna say, get out of my office. If a tenured professor goes in, they're gonna say, maybe we need to biopsy that mole because Intuitively, physicians are aware of these increasing risks with age of all of these diseases, right? And so there's some implications of this. One is, how much do you guys think lifespan would increase if we completely eliminated all human cancer in adults, right? So this is, a, you know, feel free to jump in or I won't, I won't hold you up for too long if no one wants to take a stab at it. Two years. All right, Anthony says two years. That's um, that's about right. That's about right. There's a you know there's a little uh, quibbling over some of the details. The number I pulled up is about three years, and you know the 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 intended reaction here is like what? That's all you get, right? So you know we cured cancer. So the problem is, all of these other things are still creeping up on you, right? So you that's probably just what you were thinking to say this. So if you could completely cure cancer. And that's great for people who were going to die of cancer, but guess what? They'll just die of something else, right? And in, in fact, briefly, I'll just say the demographers who look at this data suspect that 
one of the reasons for increasing incidence of cancer that we observe in the developed world, people always say, oh, it's something they put in the Taco Bell, or, you know, there's environmental carcinogens are a big important factor, and they probably are, but it looks like better treatments for heart disease are measurably driving increases in cancer. So because of statins, early detection, blood pressure medication, and surgical intervention, there are people who previously would have died of heart disease who now live long enough to noticeably increase the incidence of cancer deaths instead. So you just can't win attacking these one at a time when there are far more than the four that I'm showing here, all sneaking up on you every year that you get older. So that's the good news. Um, so with that in mind, the, the question that drives the kind of research that my lab does and that I know uh, there are some labs at UW, obviously, so you guys have probably heard this pitch before, um, can we alter aging itself? And my lab asks that starting in simple model organisms. So one thing you'd wanna know to get on board is, you know, if we study something in a really simple model organism like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, cerevisiae like cereza, that's the same use we use to make beer, it's good for so many things. And we also use it to study biology. And the question is, if we study aging in this yeast, are we learning things that will be in any way useful outside of this yeast? So here's a little table and it summarizes data from this 2008 paper. What we're looking at is a few sort of well-known, maybe you'd call them pathways in, in longevity and aging. And DR is things that involve dietary restriction. So you can see that it works in yeast. This, this next guy is the nematode Cenorhabditis elegans. It works there. It works in our buddy, the fruit fly, Drosophila, and it works in mice. Insulin signaling, you still don't have it, but it works in all the other guys. Uh, SIR2, there perhaps is some controversy in mice, so I left a question mark, but uh, discovered in yeast to affect lifespan. It looks like it does in worms and flies. A CH9 and S6 kinase, that seems to work in all four. And TOR, you guys may have heard of this guy, rapamycin, seems to work in all of these model organisms. So the pitch here is just that we aren't spinning our wheels to try to study lifespan in these genetically tractable simple model organisms, right? So hopefully people are like, sure, yeah, okay. And then, so what did we do? And this, I wanna say first, so I don't forget, um, this is work that was done um, during my postdoc in the lab of Brian Kennedy in close collaboration with the lab of Matt Keverline throughout. And so what we all did is we screened 4,698 single gene deletions in yeast, um, but yeast have more than 4,698 genes. Does anyone know what happened to the other, other genes? Let's see what I got here, check that out. All right. The lethal mutation. Yeah, I, I didn't see, I couldn't see you said that, but yeah, they're essential. If you, if you delete them, the yeast just die. So for, for the vast majority of the ones that we think can survive without a particular gene deleted, we did look at them in the screen. Um, and when I say we, I mean a team RLS down here in the bottom right, which is this paper, this 2015 paper, had about 100 authors, uh, roughly 90 of whom were undergraduates in the Kennedy and Keverline labs who painstakingly did the experiment I'm about to tell you. So this is an actual photograph of uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And uh, what you see here is the mother cell, the larger cell, and the daughter cell, the smaller cell. And because these yeast divide asymmetrically so that the, the younger, newer cell is always smaller, you can tell apart the mother and the daughter. They also leave behind a little bud scar, a little belly button every time they divide. So the one with more bud scars is the mother. Um, and they just, they just increase in number throughout the life of the mother. And what we do painstakingly in the lab by hand is look at these cells, which are dividing roughly every 90 minutes and take the daughters and physically pick them up and move them away from the mothers and then hit a number on a keypad and then just do that for the entire lifespan of all of these cells, right? And so, the, so we're keeping a record for a large cohort of mother cells of how many times they divide and produce a new daughter on average before they just stop doing that, which they eventually do. And the kind of result that you get is this paper, this uh, graph over here on the right. And what I'm showing you in the y-axis is the fraction viable, meaning the number or percentage of the mother cells that we started out looking at that are still continuing to divide. 
And on the x-axis, we're looking at the age of these mother cells here in generations. So we're not looking at time. Some of these yeast strains divide a little faster and some divide a little slower. Here, in the way that I'm showing you this data, we're just ignoring that. And essentially, if a, if a mutant or a deletion here divides more times, we call it longer lived. And what I'm showing you here is representative data, aka um, the best deletion we got in the screen, I think, UBR2, which I'm not going to talk about anymore today. And um, and roughly out of these 4,698, we got about 238 hits. There's a, there's a lot of details in there that I'm going to just leave for now. Um, so what do we get, right? Let's get into this. Um, we got this big hairball. So I could have given you a tiny table with 238 moderately legible gene names. This should have about 238 of these large dots. And in this hairball, what I did to sort of give you something to look at while we talk about what we got in the screen is um, I put a dot for every protein encoded by one of the deletions that we found to be long lived. And the little pink lines represent published claimed direct protein-protein interactions between these proteins. And those little lines are like rubber bands. So the more interactions they are, the closer together these little dots start to glom up. And then we automatically color in overrepresented categories. So the colored categories, TCA cycle, ribosome, saga, and mannosal transferase. Um, and I just drew the ellipses. That's just, you can sort of tell that they don't perfectly capture the similarly colored dots. It's just to draw your eye to the labels. And then the proteasome is something interesting that we found, but most of the genes in the proteasome are essential. So it's not possible to get enough for that to show up overrepresented. Mitochondrial translation, it turns out because of the way that these are categorized in gene ontology, um, if there was a category for that, it would have been overrepresented. So, so I just sort of artificially circled it. Um, okay, that's the picture. We're gonna come back to it a little and then, Briefly, again, just to convince you that we're maybe we're on the right track so far here, is this just a yeast thing, right? So I gave you this list of yeast genes, and already you might think, hmm. So what we did there, just in, again in this paper that's been out a couple of years now, we took everything we could scrape from PubMed, etc., where a change, a genetic change in Cinerobitis elegans increased lifespan by lowering the activity of the gene. So a hypomorph, a null mutant, a knockout, an RNAi knockdown. And if, if the, those were the orthologs, right, of any of our yeast genes that we got in the screen, then we, we say that's a match and we did a little stats and you can see that the, the p-value is quite small. And occasionally when I first would mention this, people would say, yeah, but look at all those guys in the ribosome, that's really driving it. And, and to some extent it is, but what I can tell you is that if we just leave those out, still a significant overlap. And the, what I'm hoping that I can say then is that for the genes that aren't in this short list, maybe there's a good chance that some of the things we're looking at are conserved biology, right? Okay, so zooming in a little, in these hits, we got multiple long-lived ribosomal protein deletions. So deletions of genes that encode components of the ribosome, right? So um. Here I'm showing you those lifespans and the title sort of already jumps into the next thing. GCN4 is necessary for their increased lifespan. So this is uh, already published from the Kennedy lab, from my postdoctoral lab. So here again, these lifespans show the fraction viable on the y-axis and the aging generations on the x-axis. And I'll just take the one on the left. These are just two different ribosomal protein deletions with similar phenotypes. And you can see the black is the wild type, right? Gray is a long-lived ribosomal protein deletion. Orange is a GCN4 deletion, which is nearly indistinguishable. That's a pretty great overlap with wild type. And you can see that if we take away GCN4 from the long-lived ribosomal protein deletions, they go back almost but not entirely to the wild type. So roughly, if we squint a little, let's say GCN4 is necessary for at least most of this increased lifespan. Right. And again, jump in anytime with questions. Hopefully, I'm not running too fast through this. Yeah, Mark, um, I, I have a yes, clarifying yes. question, I think. So, okay. so RPL31A, um, definitely a ribosomal protein large. Is GCN4 a ribosomal protein or something else downstream? That's just, just you know, sort of getting into since you're introducing RPL20 and... Yeah, it's a great question. And, it's, and uh, uh, I love it when a question is my next slide. So 
that means that you know I've, I've left you with the right thing unanswered hopefully uh so that yeah so gc4 is a transcription factor and I'll, I'll say briefly what it is and i'll get into that a lot more further on and then i'll sort of say what made us think to check that right for its interaction here but it isn't a part of the ribosomal um the ribosome in the large subunit like these two guys are um yes why why you checked that would be the other interesting question because you know it just popped in there so that's this is yeah so i sort of jumped ahead just to make you be like what well, where did this guy come from and no, it, it, it worked if anyone's paying attention we're all wondering the same thing I great yeah so it doesn't mean that's the best way to structure the talk but yeah that's you should have that question right now. so here we go so what is you seen for mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it is a transcription factor I will say very briefly to put a pin in it for now, it's a nutrient responsive transcription factor. And some of you, uh, I know there are some labs at UW that, that know more about this than I do probably. So some of you may know a lot about GCN4, but I will circle back and, and really flesh it out a bit more later in the talk. And it, the, the GCN4 and its pathway are functionally conserved from yeast through humans. It's a, a very conserved pathway. Um, and then here, is a little more about GCN4 and what it is that will lead us into why would we think, why would Brian's lab, early on when we started to see these ribosomal protein deletions, extending lifespan, think to look at GCN4. So here, GCN4 is regulated translationally. Oh, and I, you know, I forgot to give you the tip off earlier. Oops, sorry. There's a little, uh, there's a tiny little yeast cartoon in the lower right now. So throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about more than one model system. And I try to have a little cartoon when I'm talking about one of them in particular. So this little guy down here means this is yeast stuff we're talking about. Um, so this cartoon uh, is showing us part of the GCN4 mRNA, right? And so the big green box is supposed to be the open reading frame, the protein coding part. And then over to the left here is the untranslated region upstream, right? So that'd be the five prime UTR. And it, it, what's really neat is that in the five prime UTR of GCN4, once the mRNA is transcribed, there are these little guys called UORFs, which are basically tiny, very short open reading frames that have a little start code on and they have a little stop code on, right? And this regulation of this pathway and this part of this pathway by ORFs in the upstream region of the mRNA is conserved through humans. Now, there is a, a rich literature around subtle differences between URF1, URF2, URF3, and URF4. Um, and I'm going to essentially steamroller over all of that for purposes of this talk today and just say we can broadly think of them as sort of if they were removed all entirely, we would expect to see more GCN4 most likely. And so one way to imagine that they act is sort of like a little wily e. coyote fake detour, right? So if a ribosome hits one of these URFs and it successfully initiates translation, then when it hits the stop code on, it falls off, right? It's needed elsewhere. And it, it's much less likely to then translate GCN4, right? And so this transcription factor, which itself responds to problems with translation, is upregulated by problems with translation that could cause the ribosome to slip past these URs. Again, glossing over some nuance for sure. Um, and th that's what led us to think that if the 60S was depleted, then the stoichiometry of the 40 and the 60 could go off, right? And that maybe this is a way that the ribosome could slip past these URs and you get more GCN4. And it turns out there are other ways to get more GCN4. And I, I telegraph it here at the end ribosomal depletion or GCN2 activation, which yes, I'm coming back to. And so the idea is that if you have some deletions of the 60S subunit perhaps, or activation of GCN2, which I'm going to explain, then uh, you might make GCN4. Question so far. So we asked what happens to GCN4. I, I led with the punchline, which is if you get rid of GCN4, these long-lived ribosomal protein deletions are no longer long-lived. So then we have a reporter and this is called a dual luciferase reporter. So we have one type of luciferase that we can measure the glow from. And it's hooked to the GCN4 promoter, to the GCN4 5 prime DTR that I just showed you a cartoon of, to the whole GCN4 ORF. And that's fused in frame to the, or that's fused to the firefly luciferase gene. And we just use a normal transcriptional terminator. And on this, there's a UR3 marker for the yeast people. And on the same plasmid, there's a phosphoglycerokinase 1 promoter, which we take to be a housekeeping, you know, it's not supposed to change. And of course, we validate that in all the experimental conditions we study. 
and it's fused to a different Lucifer regime, and that's as an internal controller to try to get a tighter measurement of what's going on here, right? And then when we do this, here's the data I showed you before about the lifespans, just to remind you for context. And here underneath, I'm showing you what GC and 4 luciferase normalized to the PJK1 looks like. And in the wild type, if we set that to one, you can see that in the RPL31A deletion that's long lived and in the RPL20B deletion that's long lived, guess what? GC and 4 is up. And this is published, and I think it's the last published data I'm going to show you. And this is in yeast. Does that circle back a little bit to what you were asking, Alex? Yes, I think so, and it's it's nice to know. So, so what you're saying is it's it's upregulated in long-lived ribosome deletion strains. Yeah, and that that reminds me to add in in data that I didn't try to shoehorn in here, but in this paper, um, there are some ribosomal deletion strains that do not increase lifespan, and it um, we understand why some do and some don't, and I'm not going to get off into it, but I'll just say those do not upregulate GC4 of the ones we checked, right? Of the ones and we checked. You have you checked um, non-ribosome pathways to see if GCN4 is involved in some of those as well? Not only us, but yeah. So we, so I, that's what I'm going to mainly focus in on, although I'm going to be talking about things that still work through this UR thing, we think, through GCN2. And, um, but yeah, it's it's not entirely clear how many things might go through this. But, but so more than I'm going to talk about, including things that have been published, and uh, less than we probably know so far, if that speaks to it a little bit. Um, so this one, it was like obvious mechanistically why it might depend on that, right? But there, but there are some other things where it wouldn't shock me to be to for it to be found out later that GCN4 is up, and that if you get rid of GCN4, nothing's happening. And so that's part of what I'm going to continue to talk about. But I don't want to go off too much on some of these other pathways. But like uh, Tor, it's been reported uh, if you get rid of the GCN4 response, it's no bueno. So um, so tRNA synthetases. Here's a little cartoon again. This brown weird sort of lock and key enzyme of some sort is a tRNA synthetase. And here is an actual depiction of amino acid, the blue ball. And then the weird purple ribbony thing is supposed to be a tRNA. And what tRNA synthetases do is attach tRNAs to amino acids. And you typically have a different tRNA synthetase enzyme for every tRNA, and it will attach it to its correct amino acid. And um, it turns out that tRNA synthetases, their structure and their mechanism are ancient and highly conserved. So soil microorganisms that are constantly trying to chemically murder one another love them as targets. And there are a lot of ways to chemically target this enzyme, typically competitively inhibiting it, although there's, there's other things as well. And so the data that I already showed you that's published led us to wonder, and the fact that I'm talking about it probably telegraphs the answer, could we inhibit tRNA amino acyl charging chemically. And the reason that we care about that is summarized here at the bottom of the slide. It turns out that there is a protein called GCN2. It's shaped kind of like a tRNA synthetase and it can sense tRNAs, but only when they aren't charged with their amino acids. So it's a, it's a sensor for uncharged amino acids. So in a cell that isn't being tinkered with by scientists, that probably means you're nitrogen starved, amino acid starved. But in any case, when it senses an accumulation of uncharged tRNAs, GCN2 is a kinase. It phosphorylates the IF2, which uh, interferes with translation initiation. That generally lowers overall translation. But because of the UERF thing that I briefly sketched out, it paradoxically upregulates translation of GCN4 for a while. Now, if you just shut down all translation because no tRNAs are getting charged, there's no getting around that. So the idea then was, could we inhibit tRNA synthetases and upregulate GCN4 and then, fingers crossed, right, what's going to happen? So so the first thing you do is we look at biologically active concentrations of these guys. So here's some tRNA synthetase inhibitors. And then the top I'm showing you in liquid, the doubling time and minutes of yeast. And as we add more and more of one of these inhibitors, you can see you eventually really, really increase the doubling time. So we're just slowing the yeast growth. And we were just looking for the doses where they're not indistinguishable from untreated, but they're not dead because with some of these, you can definitely just stop all translation and kill them. And uh, I'll, I'll touch back on that. And then here's a, just a different version in, in solid media where you can see the relative growth as measured by like the total uh, cells we find after a certain amount of time decreases as we add more and more of this drug. 
And for the aficionado, which is probably at least one in the audience that knows why we did it this way, it, we put them at four degrees and at 30 degrees for a couple of weeks to simulate conditions of our lifespan experiments to show that the activity of these compounds in yeast plates would survive uh, biologically through a whole yeast lifespan experiment. So then we did a yeast lifespan experiment. Oh, then we did this, sorry. So we took these, we took a tRNA synthetase inhibiting compound and we looked at our dual luciferase reporter and asked what happens to our buddy GCN4. So now here on the y-axis is the level of GCN4, like I showed you with the ribosomal protein deletions. And here is a, a arbitrarily spaced, not you know, evenly spaced set of concentrations here. And uh, what you can see is that in wild type yeast, GCN4 goes up quite a lot. And eventually it goes back down because the the, the blocking of overall translation by the inability to charge tRNAs overwhelms the UR-related upregulation of GCN4 at some point. So this dose response curve is, uh, is typical in the examples that we've looked at. And as this pathway at the bottom would suggest, and we had hypothesized, it depends completely on GCN2. If we take yeast that are deleted for GCN2, nothing happens when you add these compounds. So then we took some of these concentrations we had narrowed in on, and I'm showing you yeast replicative lifespan again here and on the left is wild type, where if we add a tRNA synthetase inhibitor, we can increase the yeast replicative lifespan. And on the right, if we've deleted GCN4, not happening. So the next thing we wanted to do, so questions so far, more questions. Uh, GCN2 is, I've, did you say it and I just misheard it? It's it's a transcription factor as well, or nope. Uh, let me go back. It's a um, you know, so uncharged tRNAs. It's since GCN two is a is a sensor. It senses uncharged tRNAs, and the result of that is that if it senses too many, you know, there's some sort of equilibrium or something. It uh, it phosphorylates the IF two, right? And there's okay. this general this general integrated stress response. It turns out there's a set of kinases more in humans and in, in, in mice than in yeast. Um, and in yeast, it's really just this actually. And uh, they can phosphorylate the IF2 to lower overall translation. So I'll circle back to say that in mammalian cells, there's another kinase, PERC, and it senses ER unfolded stuff. And it will also phosphorylate the IF2 to be like, hey man, put the brakes on translation, right? And okay, so when it's, when, it's, when it's phosphorylating EIF2, it's inhibiting it. It's inhibiting trans, it's, it's causing EIF2 to initiate translation worse overall, okay. which through this, bizarre mechanism up here actually upregulates GCN4 because it's 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 uh, opposite day because of these URFs, right? Got it now. Yeah. I okay. Awesome. I'm glad. Just, it was a little bit, like you said, a little Rube Goldberg-esque. Yeah. Yeah. You should try putting that into a specific game size length. Let me know if you got any ideas. Okay. So, so now... With this is the picture so far, and we're like, hey man, we've got this answer in yeast. Why don't we look in our old buddy, the nematode scene ribidus elegans, actual photo attached? And then we did that. A lot of this work was done by an extremely talented PhD student in my lab, Christine Robbins, and um, it greatly extends worm lifespan, is what I'm going to show you here. So at the bottom here is the same pathway I've been showing you, except in worms, GCN4 is called ATF4, right? It all works the same way. And there's one little wrinkle I want to show you here. I think we've got time to mention. Black is the completely untreated worms. The, the compound shown here has to be dissolved in DMSO. And in previous work that's already been published, DMSO slightly but very reliably extends C. elegans lifespan through mechanisms that are not at all fully understood. So this, this line that my cursor is on now, this sort of lightest aqua line, is really the baseline you should be comparing to because you already get a little something from the DMSO. But even relative to that, which is what all these asterisks are relative to, we get a great and dose dependent, very large lifespan extension by inhibiting tRNA synthetase inhibitors in C. elegans. And you can see we did this with quite a lot of worms. These are uh, quite significant and um, so far so good. So then we said, but what if we deleted ATF4, which used to be called ATF5 until last year in worms. So I hope I renamed them all. Um, in all my slides. So now here is worms deleted completely for uh, ATF4. And right, if I kind of go back and forth, you can see the black line looks the same. 
In this case, yellow is the DMSO only. It still reliably extends slightly. And then everybody else, you get nothing. And in fact, these last two guys are statistically significantly shorter, right? Because if, you, if you're messing with translation and you can't get the benefit of ATF4, it can only hurt you, right? So this really shows us that, you know, not only is this drug extending lifespan, but it's doing it in the way that we hypothesized when we started out, probably, right? Questions there. Go ahead. The worm has the same decoy orfs. Yes, it's um the exact number of them in their placement is a little different. I didn't make a, a cartoon for the worm one, but I'm going to show you the mouse one in a second. But yeah, so it, I'll, I'll give you even a different wrinkle. GCN2 is sequenced similar from yeast to humans. Uh, EIF2 is sequenced similar from yeast to humans, and the transcription factor ATF4 is similar in everything except yeast. In yeast. It's the same place in the pathway. It does the same job. It's regulated by UORFs, but it sequences something completely different. And it's probably got swapped out in some crazy yeast genome duplication kind of thing. Like I don't think it's fully understood, but we treat it as functionally orthologous. Although if you just blasted it, you'd get at all the other organisms that I'm gonna tell you about and every other part of the pathway in all organisms, but the yeast version of the transcription factor has a very different sequence. It does the same job and is regulated in the same way at every step. Anyway. So yeah, they all have the URs. Oh yeah, and so then we looked at the GCN2 as well. And uh, here it's not the same horizontal scale, but it, you also can't extend GCN2 asterisk, or can you? Because if we get rid of GCN4, ATF4 in worms, nothing's happening at any concentration. If we get rid of GCN2, which by our simplest model should be required, at very high doses, we can get a little effect, a real and repeatable effect. So there's something ATF4 dependent, but GCN2 dependent potentially. It isn't most of the effect, but it's something. And um, we, we don't know. We don't. I don't have a favorite model for what's going on there. I just throw it out there in case anybody else does. And then so one other thing for the people who think about aging and some of the aging pathways, this is sort of anticipating a question that maybe no one was going to ask, but um, we can look at this model called E2 in worms, and it encodes a little. Um, receptor, basically a, an ion channel subunit. And if you have an E2 mutation, your little worm pharynx doesn't pump as much. So this is a cartoon of a worm with some false color overlaid. And then there's a little cartoon zoom in of its pharynx. And this, this little bulb here pumps anytime it smells food. And there are things that control its rate of pumping. But if you have an E2 mutation, your rate of pumping is severely limited. And the total amount of food you can consume is limited. And you live longer because you are calorically restricted. And what we showed is that these tRNA synthetase inhibitors can proportionally extend E2 about the same as they extend normal worms, which we take to suggest that this is in no way related to caloric restriction. And we have a few other lines of evidence that uh, support that, but I just thought I would throw this one out there. So again, this is just a lifespan, vertical axis is how many worms are alive, the horizontal axis is days, and you can see in Puzzlingly, DMSO doesn't seem to extend in this little 100 worm experiment. So I don't know if that was known before. And, uh, and it's not what we're here to study, but, but in any case, the drug still does, right? So that's the two blue lines. And um, so, so far to summarize what I've said, tRNA synthetase inhibition can extend lifespan and that's dependent on GCN4 or in worms ATF4. Um, so if I come back to one of these cartoon pathways, right? When you're nitrogen starved, you have uncharged tRNAs. They are sensed by GCN2. That phosphorylates EIF2. The phosphorylation of EIF2, as I mentioned, reduces translation, right? Because it reduces translation initiation, except paradoxically up to a point, it increases GCN4 translation, which can we think be increased directly by these ribosomal subunit deletions. And I mentioned briefly that in especially in higher organisms, so in mice and in humans, there are other stresses that can phosphorylate EIF2 and give you the same result. And so there's literature suggesting, there's a lot of literature variously suggesting that it's the reduced translation part here, output, that's really leading to the increased lifespan and that it's not something downstream of this conserved transcription factor. So we wanted to look into that. And it, just so I should mention, translation is reduced by inhibiting tRNA synthetases a couple of ways. One is because EIF2 gets phosphorylated as we discussed a couple of times. The other is you're just shutting down translation because if you don't have any charged tRNAs, regardless of all that other signaling, at some point you can't make any proteins, right? You're, whatever tRNA that is that you're inhibiting, you're not gonna be able to incorporate it into anything. So that's 
more direct, but also just inhibiting overall translation. So questions here about where we're going with this or anything else? Right on. So, all right, let me see who's here. No one asking any questions, all right? So um, now- Mark, Mark yes? later I'll ask. Yeah, okay. it might be not maybe now or maybe later, just can you put this in the context of where this fits with like the ribosome quality control complex and the, the NAC and the, the RAC, like this would be before all of that, right? Yeah, well, well, I'll talk about it a little, but probably we haven't differentiated everything that we could differentiate. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, but that's just, and, and maybe that was too much jargon right away, but there's a few other complexes associated with nascent peptide chains and, and M. For sure. And yeah, so something I'll say is that we don't understand if there might be any any um, specificity to which tRNA and if it matters, but we're going to find that out very soon. So yeah, that's part of what you would get into with these complexes. So um, can we separate reduced translation from GCN4 activation and the effect on lifespan? So here what we did is we did um, click chemistry protein synthesis. And I mentioned it because if you if you haven't done this, it's awesome and it works really, uh, it's really, I say it's really easy. To my grad student, Christine, it was very easy. So, so you take some yeast cultures, you add l homopropargol lysine, which can be incorporated in place of, I wanna say this should look like methionine, but the point is it's an amino acid that has like a triple bond that we can covalently stick stuff to, like say a fluorescent marker. So you can, you can label your cells and then you run them through a fax machine and then you can measure overall nascent protein synthesis in a certain window of time and it, it works great. And that's what we did. And so what I'm showing you here is our tRNA synthetase inhibitors and their effect on overall protein synthesis overall, just bulk in wild type yeast. And you can see it really shuts down protein synthesis, right? And then here it is again in GCN4, exactly the same. And so in case someone's thinking this, these are both normalized to their own untreated controls, but the two untreated controls, GCN4 and wild type, are indistinguishable from one another. GCN4 deletion itself does not really affect bulk translation from what we saw. I just put them in two different panels. So what that means is these drugs, whether you have GCN4 or not, completely shut down protein synthesis a lot. But in one case, you get a great increase in lifespan. In the other case, you don't. So guess what? It's not the protein synthesis decrease. It's something downstream of GCN4, at least in this narrow context, right? So then we said, let me look a little more broadly. Can we lower translation and ask if that's sufficient to change lifespan? So here's cyclohexamide. It's after initiation. It's involved in the translocation step, right? And uh, when you treat cells with cyclohexamide, as you can imagine, translation is inhibited. So here it is again. There's not as many asterisks in this graph because um, our, our zero control was really noisy for some reason in, across these three samples. We should probably add some more samples. But I think we can all agree that cyclohexamide lowers overall protein synthesis at several concentrations. And especially we can say that at 1500, but guess what it does to lifespan? Nothing. So here's the yeast lifespan. On the y-axis is the percent yeast viable and on the x-axis is the aging generations. And at no point when, including ones that I just showed you, protein synthesis is greatly reduced. Is there any increase in lifespan? And if any of these vary significantly from the control, it's because they have shorter lifespan. So our, ah, and then yet another one, if we move back to worms briefly, just to really wrinkle it up, <laughs> these drugs can cause developmental delay in worms, right? And so what I'm showing you is the delay versus concentration of the drug, because worms are exquisitely sensitive to nutritional cues during development, but the developmental delay is identical between the wild type worms and the ATF4 deleted worms. In other words, that developmental delay is an effect of overall lowered translation, which is independent of ATF4, where the, whereas the lifespan, which is dose dependent for these drugs, depends completely and totally on ATF4. So we think that these effects are broadly separable. So our model, so first the worm model is that we take to suggest the effects of lowered overall translation and of downstream ATF4 stuff can be separated, as I just said. And we think our current working model is that in all of the things we're studying, it's transcriptional targets downstream of this conserved transcription factor and not overall lowered translation that's clutch for the increased lifespan that we're seeing. So you can guess where we're headed. So then, of course, instead we veered over into mammalian cells real quick. We can't measure lifespan in mammalian cells, but we can 
look at what's going on with ATF4, which happily is still called ATF4. So here, to go back to something Alex asked earlier, is a cartoon of the mouse mRNA. So you can see there's this little UARF. And then the other UARF does a different thing where it, it crosses the start codon of ATF4. So if you pick up the start for UARF2, you're never going to start ATF4 because you're just going to slip on by like out of frame or whatever, right? But in, in general, right, the point is if you if you lower initiation at the UARFs, again, glossing over some nuance, you would expect to see more ATF4. And so here is a part of a plasmid we have now. It's ATF4 GFP. So there's the cytomegalovirus promoter. There's the whole ATF4 5 primed untranslated region with the UARFs fused in exactly the same way, but instead of to ATF4 to EGFP. And again, there's the pathway again, and it shows you the, the names for the mammalian one. This is done by a PhD student in the lab, Blaze Mariner. And when Blaze looked in mammalian cells, what he could just show is that these tRNA synthetase inhibitors rocket up the levels of ATF4 in a dose-dependent manner. And um, we're still dialing some of this in, so you can see the error bars, I'd like them to get smaller. And then here we have a new positive control. So in this cartoon pathway at the bottom, GCN2 can activate EAF2. There's another one, PERC. It senses misfolded proteins and it can activate EIF2 in a way that does not depend on GCN2 at all. And we can cause that with a drug called Daxagargan. So that's TG is a positive control in this graph that doesn't depend on GCN2. So you can see in the other ones, as we add more and more of a tRNA synthetase inhibitor, ATF4 goes up, but only if GCN2 is present. Whereas if we activate EIF2 through PERC, a different kinase, it goes up and that doesn't depend on GCN2. And that is the level of ATF4 reporter, but then we made, we wanted to know what about transcriptional activation downstream of this transcription factor. So we made another reporter where we took a, a consensus ATF4 transcriptional response element where the transcription factor binds in MEFs. And we took a minimal promoter and we fused that to luciferase. And we showed you the same thing again, where as we add more and more of these drugs up to a point, we get more and more activation of, from a target for ATF4 transcriptional activity. That depends completely on the presence of GCN2. Uh, here I didn't show you that that's garden control, sorry. And then eventually, like I showed you back in the yeast data, we can start to shut things down because you can you can block translation enough that that, that wins out over the effect of the UARF, sorry. So that's showing you that a lot of this is conserved in MEFs, that we can do it in mammalian cells at doses that don't kill the cells, and that we can zone in on the most optimal concentrations. And after the last thing I showed you that was published in yeast back at the beginning, uh, another lab, Richard Miller's lab, took a look at some mice that were already known to be long-lived for other reasons, like Snell dwarf mice, for example. And they showed that in multiple tissues by Western blots and stuff, that ATF4 was up and that known ATF4 targets were up as proteins in mice that were long-lived in comparison to normal-lived mice. Bum, bum. So here's the summary. Big payoff from altering aging itself. Hopefully, I've, you know, I'm planting that seed for anyone who's not already on board. We did a genome-wide deletion screen. We found long-lived deletions. They are clustered in pathways. They're not just random. They are, broadly speaking, conserved, at least through worms. We showed lifespan extension by tRNA synthetase inhibitors, both in yeast and in worms, completely dependent on this pathway on the gc 4 atf 4 um, we, I think we convincingly have shown that it's not going to be because of lowered overall translation, but it's going to be because of transcriptional targets of GCN4 and ATF4. Future directions where we're headed with this, we're obviously looking at a lot of transcriptomics to see exactly what it is downstream and, and test which ones of those are responsible for these phenotypes. Um, we have a big panel of tRNA synthase inhibitors now to try to ask if there's any pattern in which do and don't work and to try to find the best ones that have the least side effects and the best concentration profiles and stuff across these organisms, but especially moving into mammalian cells and mice. And we are starting mouse slice bands of these compounds. And so with that, I'll briefly say thanks again. And I wanna remind you guys that the early work that I showed starting all of this, the screen was done while I was in Brian Kennedy's lab in collaboration with your colleague, Matt Caroline. I've just started to collaborate with Alex Mendenhall and I should say um, that although he's not a current collaborator with my lab, I've also had a chance to work with Daniel Promislow at UW, and that, which was great. So here's everybody in my lab. I mentioned some of the people that did the work that I described, and here's a few of my other collaborators, and here are some of our funding sources. And that's my email in case you have a question that you forget to ask, and I'm happy to take other questions. Thanks a million.
Wow, Mark, that's a that's a lot of work. That's awesome. That's thanks, man. Impressive. I can't. And now you're doing it in mice too. I'm sure. We're every, doing it in mice. Yeah, that's always a an interesting nervous troll. <laughs> I have a, I have my first rejected uh, Aya cook in my inbox, but I it, they they weren't me. They just said we need to take a look at these notes, and I was like, I will do that after my seminar. So hopefully, it's not too bad. So I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. Um, I have no advice for you on mice, having done <laughs> no mice work ever. But uh, you know. I'm sure Tony or someone else in Matt's lab that does mouse work could, you know, be happy to chat about that. Yeah, my plan is that it was going to be to um to talk to those experts about mouse lifespans, but um, and essentially what I've proposed to do is is basically looking at what they've published, and now I want to get the you know the stuff that didn't fit in the methods and make sure we're doing this right. But, uh, yeah. Awesome. Um. So, does anyone in our audience have any questions for Mark? I, I'm sure Mark would be happy to answer anything. Yeah, Mark, Tony, do you plan to look at some of those uh, ATF4 uh, targets that it transcribes uh, to see if one of those kind of hundred targets might be primarily involved in your lifespan extension? Yep, we, we, we propose to and we have done. So, so in, in data that we, we just haven't validated, it's not ready to go on the slide yet. We've done the transcriptomics. We've done like 12 replicates per condition transcriptomics in MEFs because that's how we roll. And then with something similar in yeast, looking at both the ribosomal protein deletions and the tRNA synthetase inhibitor treatment to study each alone and what they have in common. Um, we don't have the ribosomal protein deletions in the MEFs, just the tRNA synthetase inhibitors. We've got proteomic data in yeast also. We're doing cross-species correlation for all this. And um, there's geo categories and stuff that leap right out at us and some that we are like, oh, yeah, that's not surprising. It's probably what that is, but um, we haven't validated any of them. Right. So there's, so I have all these, you know, these like shiny, colorful bioinformatics pictures, but we are just getting to the point of going back through and, and, you know, our, our gold standard is the lifespan phenotype, but we're going to look at other stuff as well. Um, so like in, in the mammalian cells, we can look at other things, but not the lifespan phenotype. So that's exactly where we are right now with that. And then um, that's, yeah, that's where that story currently is. It's just not quite ready to, um, to put on a slide yet. Yeah, Good that'll be exciting. I look forward to it. Thanks. Oh, I had a quick question or, or a comment, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, but I was thinking you've been looking at transcriptomics and proteomics, but have you also considered going back and looking at um, the epigenetic states like methylation, because in terms of aging, you've seen like pretty good success with, with like looking at methylation and predicting uh, human age, like uh, uh, biological age. So that's sure. been working pretty well. Uh, and they've, like they've identified very specific regions where there's like epigenetic changes and that you can use to predict human age. Um, so have you thought about like uh, bringing that component in as well? Yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah, so the, these these epigenetic clocks, like the stuff that originally came out from Steve Horvath are, are pretty cool. Um, so the reason we really started with transcriptomics is um, because it's a transcription factor, like the last known suspect, right? The last piece of evidence on the surveillance camera before the you know person vanished is the uh, is a transcription factor. So we're like, we know what it does. It alters transcription. So let's look at transcription, right? So, and then if what we found was a bunch of things involved in histone modification or stuff, I would jump on that. None of that has, has leapt out at us so far. But, um, and then it, honestly, although, although ATF4 is itself translationally regulated and we did all this bulk translation stuff, the real reason we have proteomics data is that someone gave us a pilot where they just did some proteomics data for us. And we looked and it, it looks all like the transcriptomics data. And so, um, but, um, so I, I agree that there's interesting things to be found there, but I, I would wait for the data that we have to point us there. I think we would, I think our lowest hanging fruit is transcriptomes because it's a transcription factor, but, but just relevant to that, if, you, if I go back to my original hairball, one of the other clusters of genes that, that is just waiting for us to circle back almost certainly involves that stuff. And so I, I'm not, it's not at all clear to me that that ties into any of this GCN4 ATF4 stuff though. But um, that's a great question. Yeah. So that's that's my current thinking. But if people see a way why it's it's more clutch than I realize to look straight away at the epigenetics, we could definitely do that.
Um, thank you for your question. Are there any other uh, attendees who would like to ask Mark anything? We've got we've got uh, plenty of time. If anyone has anything else to to ask, okay, I'll ask a question. So, uh, about your preliminary data that you haven't it's not ready for prime time yet. Yeah, I'm a bit of a you know. Again, so, little, I mean, just a little. So, you know, are, are you familiar with the Hayflick limit and Leonard Hayflick and sure, telomeres, homogeneity views on aging? Um, one of them that was sort of a simple, um, uh, how do I say, like a postulate is that molecular aging um, start that, that aging starts when molecular damage exceeds molecular repair. Yeah, like some sort of air catastrophe or something. Yeah, something like that. But I mean, right, it's, it's amazing how you can break your arm as a kid and it heals darn near perfectly. But if you do it as a 40 or 50 year old, you're going to feel it the rest of your life, like that sort of a thing. Like just the, the, the repair capacities of youthful systems and how that declines with age and, and blah, blah, blah. But the point I'm getting at here is that many of mutants end up having some decrease in molecular turnover or increase in molecular repair. And there haven't been many long lived animals that have been long lived and more robust that like a longer lived like more athletic animal that i think well i don't know if i agree like right i mean so mutant why yeah. am i cutting off your question or was that was that no, no i was just going to ask I, I was saying that the fact that you can do something without and, and there's drugs i think that have gotten that have had pretty good effects i'm just saying that a lot of the mutants in worms they're not that healthy even though they're they're living a long time they're not having a great life they're not like running and jumping super high they're not but like daft 2 i would take i will have what that guy's having they seem pretty jazzed right like isp1 no thank you daft 2 i'm in right? yeah so, but they don't when, when we look at them for a long time over time on the cameras they don't seem like they're moving that much like i mean hit them, uh, well, we, so i'm normally only looking at them when i like rattle their cage and then they're they're pretty jazzed they may just they like are. chill a lot they may like um just get in a lot of RuneScape or, you know, just really, really sit still. That, that's what it place. seems like. Yeah. Anyway, when, when we look over time, that it seems like they're just sort of a little bit like they're yeah, so, a refrigerator mutant, as Jason would call it. Um, yeah, so I think if you, if you, you know, if you take a, a step back to these big picture things, but before thinking about how it ties into the pathway I talked about today, I would just say, um, I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of a, I think it, you could say it's pretty obvious that, right, so living longer with no, downside should be selected for so you know there's a downside under the conditions that they evolved in right i mean you you postulate that there's a downside you just don't always know what it is and if you if you look at daft 2 they first lay eggs later and if you put them in a in a thunderdome with n2 they after a few generations you just have n2 because their generation time is slightly shorter right and that's been done um and so it's always something like that but like it could, what if it was that you know there's a drug but you kind of always have to wear a light jacket because you're a little bit colder i'm cool with that if i could live a lot longer yeah, you know, it could be yeah. something where evolutionarily we, there's almost certainly a cost but it may be a cost that we're pretty cool with and that we that's would, right we can control the climate all, all that sort yeah, of yeah yeah but and, but the but i would also say right if you look at a lot of these long-lived mutants another another sort of really broad trend would be they're stress resistant right so you dump that's them in right, paraclot right. you dump them in peroxide so that's what I was getting at, that you don't have to decrease translation too. For, so the point was, yeah. the long-winded point here that, that we're circling back to is that there are all these issues with some of these mutants about like, they're not, you know, they're not putting as much energy into reproduction. They're not able to, to do as much with as many calories per unit time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even, or they're just not doing it in the in the um, germline, that sort of thing. The, I see now where you were going. Yeah. Yeah. Calories have never been cheaper. We can stuff our face with calories. Yeah. That's not the problem. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying a, a lot of biological systems have, have gone on with a problem of calorie optimization and limiting calories and, and that sort of a thing. And there are these great programs that exist to keep the system alive while they're starving because it's sort of a common thing. Right, that's right. What and I think is that yeah, so you I think have a way to, to extend lifespan without inhibiting translation, which so many different longevity treatments seem to decrease translation. Yeah, but I think they don't have to because I, th I think, right. I think at least a good chunk of those, at least at least the ones we're looking at, if you could just get rid of that. So in other words, I'll, I'll say this. We have doses where we don't see any side effects in the cells. We don't see any cell death. Um, we we don't see any real change in the doubling time in yeast barely. We we do see developmental delays in worms. They are so sensitive, right? You can't, you can't do anything to translation without that having a dramatic it, effect. And you, you can also, we can also treat effects. them as adults only. And it yeah, works. And, it doesn't work as strongly. But, but so the thing is, we can find doses where we don't think we're really 
we're really, um, you know, hurting you by lowering your, we're not lowering your translation in a way that has a lot of effects, but we're still getting the lifespan because we're still starting to upregulate GC4, ATF4. Now that's, that's hard to dial in and that's just, that's a rough guess, but yeah, but I think more hopefully if we know what's downstream, then we can uncouple it from the overall lowered translation because right now we do have something I didn't get dragged into as much and I was ready to answer about is, it's it's a tight dose, right? You it's easy to give them too much, and then and then you lose the lifespan increase, and then in fact you can eventually at the highest doses that we've done lifespans, it always greatly shortens it, right? So so that's a problem when we're in mice where we can't just try ten doses. Is that it's really it's really key that we try to get the right doses to look because if you if you go a little too much, it doesn't kill you, but you don't get a lifespan extension anymore. And so if we could skip the lowered translation and go to what's downstream, we probably wouldn't have such a you know a crazy sensitivity where there's this this kind of careful range you got to be in to get the real, the, all the good without any of the bad. So if that, if that kind of speaks to what you're asking. I, I hope so. I hope we didn't confuse anyone, but the, the point was just that, you know, with some of these more detailed um, analyses like you're getting into, we can get past some of these broader, more pleiotropic interventions. That's what I'm sort of getting at. And that, that it's nice to find that you can get some of the beneficial effects. Um, and this might be for people that haven't studied aging a lot, but a lot of times it seems like you're really, um, you know, decreasing translation a lot in many different longevity treatments. So it was nice to find that you can uh, extend lifespan. Yeah, that. I mean, you know, I sort of hope that it's not always true, so that I don't have to pick a fight with everybody whose whose model involves lower translation. But I think I think at least for the things we're narrowly looking at, it would be hard to say that it could be because of the lower translation. So uh, you know. That's, we couldn't help but look at it for these things, and I, I think, which it helps us to know that we need to focus on the transcriptional targets, right? So. Yeah, so uh, do any of our other attendees have any other questions for Mark? Going once, going twice, and sold. I'll stop the recording now. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>